you by Gary Paulson. Chapter 12, in which all things change. The time of summer ended suddenly enough. In the fields along the driveway, there was a 40 acre piece in corn. It was silage or field corn as opposed to sweet corn and meant to feed the milk cows in the winter and grew to truly gigantic proportions. Plants seven feet tall were not uncommon and from our perspective, between four and five feet, as the stalks grew taller, the field became an inviting green jungle. By lying on the ground, it was possible to see down the rows through a cleared area about a foot high before the leaves started. But standing limited visibility to a few feet, but standing limited visibility to a few feet in any direction, and the field became a perfect place to play hide and seek. Or ambush. Or as Harris put it, it's time for cob wars. The corn ears weren't fully ripe and wouldn't be until later in the summer or early fall when they would be chopped for silage and stored in a silage pit. But they had developed enough to make almost perfect missiles of nearly a pound. And when thrown correctly with a flick of the wrist, if they hit you in the head, they'd put you down. It's this way, Harris explained to me. You go in the corn first and be the commie jack and I'll give you a head start and then come after you. Who are you? G.I. Joe. Why do I have to be the commie Jap? I want to be G.I. Joe. Why do I have to be the commie Jap? I want to be G.I. Joe. Harris studied me inside. Look, who made the game up? Me or you? Well, you. And who knows the rules? I didn't know there were any rules. Me, that's who. So I have to be the one to hang back and make sure it's all working right. And that makes you the commie Jap and me, G.I. Joe. It just figures. It didn't actually figure that way to me, but it was clear that if we were going to play, I would have to be the commie Jap. And so I at length nodded and moved into the corn. It was like stepping into another world. Light filtered down through the plants and cast a green glow that made me want to walk softly and whisper, and I crouched and moved forward carefully. I hadn't gone eight feet when something hit me in the back of the head so hard my eyes crossed. Gotcha, you gooner commie jap! I wheeled, and there was nothing. Just the rustling green corn. I took two steps, started a third, and took another cob in the back of the head. Damn it, Harris, quit that! Commie jap gooner! And he was gone again. By this time, I heard him, and I thought I was about to be hit again, so I dropped to my stomach and found the clear area. There he was, or his legs, two rows over and slightly toward the road. I smiled, pulled an ear of corn off of the nearest plant, slithered on my belly two rows over, rose suddenly and threw the cob as hard as I could where he had been standing, and missed. Fell for it, you call me Jap Gooner? And another cob caught me in the back of the head. Somehow, as I rose, he had dropped and gone around and back of me for a rear attack. This time, the cob caught me hard enough to make my ears ring, and rage took over any thought, and I went for him. From that point on, it disintegrated into a catch-me-if-you-can brawl with me chasing him through the corn until I couldn't run, and both of us finally falling to the ground, laughing inside the corn near the edge of the driveway. You make a miserable commie jap, Harris said, lying back in the dirt. That's because I was supposed to be G.I. Joe. The sound of a car engine stopped me, and we peeped out of the corn just in time to see the deputy's car go by headed for the house. It's the same guy who brought me, I said. I wonder what he wants. You likely, he's come to take you home. I knew instantly that Harris was right, that the summer was done, and everything in me rebelled. I had come to belong here. I wanted to be here. I thought of this as home. Harris as a brother and Glennis as a sister and Newt as a pa and Claire as a mother. And didn't, didn't ever want to leave. You don't got to go. Harris had read my expression. You can stay here in the corn. I'll bring you food and a blanket and they'll never find you in a hundred years. His face had a worried, almost frightened look to it and he seemed on the edge of tears. It was all too sudden. A part of me nodded wanting to do it, hide, hide, but I knew it wouldn't work. I could hear Claire calling from the house now, calling my name and Harris's name. 
and fighting it every inch of the way, I stood and walked out of the corn and back to the house while Harris stayed in the corn. Glennis had my box from the room waiting by the deputy's car, and she smiled and handed it to me. Isn't this nice, Claire said. You're going home at last. But she didn't look happy about it, and neither did Newt, who came from near the granary, walking with his hands in his bib pockets, balled into fists, looking at the ground. Louie was nowhere to be seen. Newt said nothing but stood next to Claire, and Glennis was crying silently. And I got in the car all in moments, and the deputy turned around, and we went down the driveway and away from the farm. Or tried to. We hadn't gone a hundred yards when I saw Harris come boiling out of the corn, his bibs all over mud and his hands waving to stop the car. He came to my side and I rolled down the window. You don't got to stay gone, you know, he said, and he was crying so naturally I started to cry too. You can talk to them gooners and tell them you got to come back here. I will. You make them bring you back. I will. And the deputy pulled away and we left Harris standing there by the side of the driveway. I looked back out the rear window and he was waving one hand. So I waved back, but soon he was lost from view and the rest of the farm was gone and we were on the road heading back to town. The deputy spat out the window. Nice people, the Larsons. You have a good summer? And it was all there. The whole horses and the pigs and Ernie and the pictures and Louie and swimming and going to see the Gene Autry movie all there at once filling me so that I had to look out the window and hide my eyes. Yes, I did. I had a nice summer. Epilogue. Three weeks after I had returned home, I received a small package with the following letter inside. Dear Gooner, you know I don't write so good, so Glennis is doing this for me, except I'm worried she won't say what I want, and I don't trust the big dot, dot, dot. There, right there, she hit me. I didn't say nothing wrong, and she whacked me, so you can see things ain't changed a whole lot. I thought I'd killed Ernie when I ran over him with a wheelbarrow full of sand when he wasn't looking, but I didn't kill him, I mean. The sun, there, she hit me again. Ernie laid there for a minute and then got up and made it under the greenery before I could get the wheelbarrow turned around for another run on him. I would have turned faster except I wetted the sand down to make it good and heavy and the extra weight slowed me some. Everybody else is fine. Pa broke a finger, but it don't seem to bother him none. Ma's cooking. Glennis is looking all moon-eyed at Clyde Peterson. There, she hit me again, but she is. He's looking a hanging around, smelling at the gatepost. I wish she'd stop that. I keep getting whacked and I don't even mean it. Buzzer is all right, although he seems cross sometimes and popped me once last week. I found some graves back down off the house from homesteaders and was thinking I'd dig them up and look for treasure, but I'll wait until you come back for that. Well, that's all for now. Oh, Louie came in the other day and told me to mail you what's in the package. He said you'd know what it was. Bye, you old gooner, and hope you can come home soon. Harris. I unwrapped a piece of paper in the box and found the small figure that had been me in Louis's diorama. I held the mouse furred little statue for a long time, rolling it in my fingers. Then I put it on a windowsill where I could see it while I drifted to sleep that night and dreamed of horses and farms and corn and girls with blonde hair and Tarzan and Jean and a bicycle that did a hundred miles an hour carrying a freckled boy in bibs. And that's the end.